who serve this nation. And there are many ways our organizations work together to accomplish this important mission. Since 1923, the ABMC has served a special role memorializing American armed forces overseas. Today, ABMC administers permanent American burial grounds and separate memorials, monuments, and markers at sites around the world. Stretching from the Philippines and Korea across the Pacific to Midway and Hawaii, in North Africa, Gibraltar, Italy, France, England, and here at home, the ABMC honors those who served the US military overseas, many of whom gave the ultimate sacrifice. Since 1934, the National Archives has served as the nation's record keeper, preserving the permanent records of the US government for future generations. At archival facilities around our country, our staff work daily to provide researchers and other government agencies access to the over 13 billion pages, 448 million feet of film, 10 million maps, charts, and drawings, and hundreds of terabytes of electronic records in our custody. Many of these records document actions and service commemorated by the ABMC. At the National Personnel Records Center and National Archives in St. Louis, we hold the official military personnel files, World War I burial files, individual deceased personnel files, casualty records, and other personnel-related records for all those who served in the US military. These records often assist ABMC with ceremonies, burials, updating headstones, and verifying information of those service members interred in ABMC cemeteries. Within the halls of this building and in the National Archives in College Park, Maryland, just a few miles from here, we hold the unit records and other related military records that document the US military's role and activities in every major conflict in our nation's history. In fact, this evening's film includes archival footage from the National Archives. The work you do is immensely valuable, and as such, we also hold the historical records of the ABMC itself. Just this past year alone, ABMC sent the National Archives records on World War I and World War II American cemeteries, the Korean War Veterans Memorial, publications, and other records for permanent preservation. The National Archives and Records Administration looks forward to working with the ABMC in the second century of its important work. Again, let me welcome you to today's national documentary premiere. And now, I would like to introduce Secretary of the American Battle Monuments Commission, Charles K. DeJoux. Secretary DeJoux was appointed to serve in this role this past May by President Joseph R. Biden. The 20-year Army Reserve veteran holds the rank of Lieutenant Colonel and among many other assignments, served in Afghanistan in support of Operation Enduring Freedom in 2011 and 2012. He represented Hawaii's first congressional district as a member of Congress, serving on the House Armed Services Committee and House Budget Committee. Secretary DeJoux has been an active civic leader in the Hawaii State House of Representatives and Honolulu City Council, and has served as an educator at both the University of Hawaii and Hawaii Pacific University. Since his appointment, Secretary DeJoux has worked to set the agency on the path for a new century of service focused on the seamless integration of the ABMC's core mission with emerging technology and focused engagement. Please join me in welcoming ABMC Secretary Charles K. DeJoux. Good evening, everybody. On behalf of the commissioners of the American Battle Monuments Commission, our staff, and of course, the American people, good evening and welcome. I'm Charles DeJoux, and delighted to introduce all of you to our 100th anniversary of the ABMC. Um, before I begin, I want to give special thanks, of course, to the National Archives and for hosting us here and for uh, allowing us to be in this beautiful building with, of course, America's founding documents. Um, it is a delight for myself and my staff to have each and every one of you here. I do also want to recognize a few people in attendance. We have Ambassador Nicole brittner Bengshin from Luxembourg, Madam Ambassador, uh, as well as uh, Ambassador Residence Karen Price, the British Ambassador to the United States. I also want to introduce our ABMC Commission Chairman, Lieutenant General Hurtling, who is joining us here this evening. I also want to give a special recognition to each of our commissioners who are joining us here, uh, please say hello to them if you haven't met them. Uh, Commissioner Gail Barry West, Commissioner Dale Dorgan, Commissioner John Strada, Commissioner Matthew Jones, Commissioner Raymond Kemp, Commissioner Amy Looney Heffernan, Commissioner Bud Pettigrew, Commissioner Michael Smith, 
and Commissioner Dan Woodward. And we also have Commissioner Dan uh, Groberg, Flo Groberg, who unfortunately was not able to join us tonight. <coughs> also joining us here this evening, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Tom Connor, the author of War and Remembrance, uh, who did a history of the American Battle of Monuments Commission. Uh, also with us, you will meet uh, later on this evening, Gretchen Ronka, the daughter of First Lieutenant Lauren Hintz, who is buried at the Florence American Cemetery. And with so many distinguished guests, including former uh, ABMC Secretary, retired Major General Bill Matz, uh, with us here in the tent, and several of our former commissioners, uh, we are here to commemorate uh, the mission and the memories of the American Battle Mines Commission and our honorable and sacred mission. Um, and, of course, on behalf of the ABMC staff, we are so delighted that all of you can come here and celebrate 100 years of honoring and preserving the memories of the service and sacrifice of America's armed forces. Now, for the past year, we've been working together with Northern Lights Productions to produce a documentary film in honor of our centennial. We knew when we started this that this film needed to be a little bit different. Um, it needed to be unique and convey the mission of the American Battle Mines Commission. It needed to speak emotionally and evocatively and show how the ABMC keeps the stories of our fallen alive. The result, I believe, is a remarkable encapsulation of the marriage between preservation and progress that is reflected in our centennial commemoration. While the film shares some very powerful stories for our past, it also looks forward to our mission going into the future for our second century. I'm extremely pleased to share with you that this film with you tonight, and I want to give a special acknowledgement to, Northern, to the Northern Lights team, which helped us put this together. He and here with us tonight for their work are both Beth and Andy, uh, and to the dedicated public affairs team here at ABMC. I hope you find it, as I did, a powerful and beautiful tribute uh, to the men and women whose legacies are we honor and carry forward in the roadmap for the ABMC's next 100 years. Thank you all again for joining us. I hope you enjoy our film. Mahalo and aloha. My dad was one guy who enlisted and went to war, became a pilot, and did his job, and that was symbolic of so many other Americans. This beautiful cemetery with the wall of the missing, the beautiful chapel, is a place of reflection. To have subsequent generations of people who are looking at their family history and thinking, wow, my great-grandfather is buried here and people still remember him. ABMC is taking care of our ancestor. When people come to our sites, they're learning why this place is important, why these individual stories are important why we continue to operate the way that we do. You lose that first life on the battlefield. That one person could lose their life a second time when we forget them. There's no greater calling and no more worthy assignment than to keep that memory alive.
My name is Bruce Malone, and I am the superintendent of the Musagon American Cemetery. I do live right here on the site. You get to know the local people. They still tell the stories. You see little children being told, this soldier died in our town. My grandfather is buried at Henri Chapelle Cemetery in Belgium. What I do now, and it's a way to give back. The Argonne battlefield is one of the most hallowed places. What remains to this day, and may it ever be so, the bloodiest battle in American history. Like a lot of World War I battles, this went on for weeks and weeks. It ended with literally the armistice on November 11th, 1918. Imagine you're one of those young soldiers, and as you're moving forward, guy to the right falls, this guy over here falls, you hear a scream behind you, or your lieutenant goes down. You look back to this hillside, and the Army Graves Registration is now burying the buddies that just fell as you came across the hill. You have to be thinking, how long before I end up on that hill? How long before I'm over here? Things that happened on this hill were just horrific. But today, under our care, you can hear the birds chirping, the flag waving in the wind, and it's a tranquil, serene sight. It's an honor to be here, but above that, it's a privilege. Very few people get to do what I do, and I'm proud of that. So I will do my best at it, absolutely. I, I don't want to let these guys down. Ça demande. Il faut déjà que ça passionne les personnes, qu'ils aiment faire leur boulot. Toujours avoir une qualité de travail irréprochable. On ne peut 
pas euh, reculer d'un mois, mettons, le travail qui est au jour le jour à travailler. Qu'est-ce qui arriverait si vous ne le faisiez pas, justement <rire> Très bonne question. Ben, je pense que... Je ne sais pas, aucune idée. Je n'ai jamais eu l'occasion de... On n'a jamais eu l'occasion de laisser euh, les tilleuls non taillés un hein, an. On est obligé d'avancer. C'est pour faire avancer le travail, que le cimetière reste correct et propre. Headstones are marble. Marble, like a lot of other stones, will wear. They will crack. They will absorb things from the ground that will discolor them, and the engravings themselves will wear out. So from time to time, we have to replace headstones. The headstone could probably last 70 years out in the elements before it's no longer up to our standards. Je m'appelle Adrien Raymond, je suis robot opérateur au, sur le site de Meusargon. Mon travail consiste aux gravures des stèles. L'essence de notre travail, ça reste quand même les sépultures des soldats, que ce soit à Meusargon ou sur les autres sites. Quand je suis arrivé, j'ai compris, notamment quand j'ai vu la gravure se faire, qu'il y avait un devoir de, de perfection, de travail bien fait. de mon travail et pour la BMC et pour les états unis je vais faire attention à, à faire un meilleur travail possible pour euh, rendre le cimetière euh, comme il doit être parfait the headstones lie in perfect rows The positioning of the burials has nothing to do with rank of the individual soldiers, race, creed. For the World War I era particularly, when the army was rigidly segregated, this was a very progressive idea. I think that reflects a philosophy. There's a kind of democracy of death. In death, they're all equal. Almost immediately after the First World War stopped in 1918, the Graves Registration Service, the GRS, got about the work of collecting 
bodies. And by that point, they were scattered in literally thousands of different grave sites. A lot of the work was done by African-American soldiers and very grim, very grim labor. The decision was made that repatriating 75,000 bodies might be a little bit too much for the resources of the government then at hand. The War Department sent out ballots to give the individual families the choice. 45,000 of those 75,000 bodies went home. A little bit less than 30,000 of them were to stay in what turned out to be eight permanent cemeteries maintained by the American Battle Monuments Commission. This soldier is the reason we're here. It's that simple. Pick one. We have the trees, the fountain, you know, the grass and all, but uh, it's all about this soldier. There were six children all together. William was the oldest and my grandmother was the next oldest. She was pretty close to William. He was killed in 1918, fighting in the Meuse Argonne. Our great grandparents were asked, do you want William remains to come home to Minnesota? My great grandparents said, no, the remains can stay in France. And so the ABMC cemetery was a place of closure. We would get a lot of questions saying, you know, you gotta bring the remains home. You, you know, they're coming home. That was always the thing, you, you know, it was so important that the remains go home. When I said, no, they are home. I mean, you know, this is Omaha Beach. The fact that he was a D-Day casualty, that's not lost on us. I knew that these were people of my uncle's generation it just seemed like the right place. Je m'appelle Olivier Gassion et je suis le responsable technique et opérationnel du cimetière de Normandie depuis 25 ans. Il a fallu trouver un endroit qui était dans des croix déjà, qui était en alignement. Il a fallu calculer pour les pentes, pour l'excavation. Nous sommes en train de préparer la plateforme 
qui doit être de niveau par rapport au terrain qui, lui, est en pente, de manière à pouvoir, avec l'élévateur, descendre le cercueil vraiment de façon parfaite et rigoureuse. I know that it's a superintendent's job to say, this is the best team I've ever had, but this is truly the best team I've ever had. They know that they're in America's most prestigious cemetery overseas. They know how important this is. Je pense que les gars qui sont enterrés ici, qui se sont sacrifiés, méritent le, le plus haut niveau Rien ne sera jamais trop beau et trop parfait pour eux. Center, face. Forward, march. Left. 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 Right, left. It's not very often when there is a memorial service and a graveside interment, and it takes place when not a single person here has ever met the deceased. That is the case with this young man we honor today. As I look across the headstones, mostly belonging to young men in their early 20s, just like Bill. I think of all of the stories associated with these amazing persons. And I think of their families, their parents, their spouses, their siblings, and perhaps in some cases, the children they never saw grow up. Ready, aim, fire. 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 Cease firing. Man, on behalf of our great foundation, please accept this flag and faithful service. The sand that we use for this operation comes from Omaha Beach itself. The rosette is a laurel wreath, which symbolizes eternity. And then the eight points of the compass, which symbolizes that we will continue to look for them at all points on the globe until they're found. The rosette also signifies that William McGowan is no longer uh, missing in action. There's 1,557 names on the wall of the missing. We added the 20th rosette today. That rosette, for me, and I think for a lot of my siblings, that was the closure. I mean, that was the, you know, that was the moment. I feel like I've done something for my grandparents when the rosette went into the wall. We've got to get this right. We want the family to think that we care, because we do. Nothing reflects better what a nation values than what it will ask its young people to go die for. And in same fashion, I think nothing speaks better of a nation than how well it will try to preserve the memory of those who have answered the call and made the, the ultimate sacrifice. They gave up their yesterdays so that our todays would be bathed in the kind of freedom and liberty that we so treasure. Anytime that you get to talk to a veteran is a very moving experience. Of course, we're, we're fewer and fewer of those, but uh, you'll find that they're incredibly humble men. I was in Luxembourg in the month of November. It's eight o'clock in the morning, and there's a tall man out there, six foot four or more, and he's got yellow roses with him. Uh, we don't open till nine, but I went out there and asked him, 
what he was here for, and he said he was here to place a yellow rose on uh, headstones of 31 of his comrades. And so we brought him inside, let him warm up, and we said, so we're going to knock this out quick because we've got a golf cart and we've got a computer system. We'll find them. And he said, no, I, I don't want to do it that way. And so he started at, row, at plot A, row one, cross number one, and went through all over 5,000 headstones and didn't miss a single one of his friends, which told me that he was reading every single one of those crosses. Joe Schumacher was the staff sergeant. He was in the 17th Airborne Division. He said on the 6th of January during the Battle of the Bulge, They've already taken heavy casualties, and they've split his company up into three platoons and given each platoon a Belgian town to defend. When they got to the town, there was a small hamlet with three homes, a barn, and a chicken coop. He was told to take three men with him and go make sure there are no forward observers in those houses. Joe had received the newest addition to his platoon. He'd been in Europe two weeks and is thrown right in the bowel of balls right away. He had no confidence in the man's ability to clear a house by himself. So he told the soldier to go clear the chicken coop, knowing there were no Germans in the chicken coop. When the soldier came back, he had found an egg. None of them had anything to eat since the 3rd of January. So there was the discussion about cooking the egg and separating it into four pieces, but everyone thought that would be a waste. And so they took the egg, they put it in a small box that they found, and they made a pact amongst each other that if any of them survived the Battle of the Bulge or World War II, he should eat the egg. Joe said he's the only one that survived. And he hasn't eaten the egg since the 6th of January, 1944, 1945. Uh, still haunts him today. God, I'm glad that I am young, free to go, wander, to venture, to explore. Let me live life while I am able. When I change from the spring of youth to the first frost of age, and then to the white winter of old age, let me be able to say, I have lived and I am not sorry. My dad wrote under a pseudonym. He used his mother's birth name rather than hence when he was writing his poetry. Uh, apparently he thought that was more sophisticated. I mean, he was 19 or 20 when he wrote these. So even though he didn't live to the white snows of old age, I think he experienced life and enjoyed it tremendously. I'm proud of all these people. Oh, Angel, what a difference from the last time we were here, that cold, rainy, windy November day. Because I know Angel Matos, the superintendent and his staff. Here we are, Grace. Ah, there it is. Lauren Hitz. You know what I find interesting is I always remember his gravesite, uh, headstone number 25. That's my birthday. That's what it reminds me of. And there's sadness, of course, but it's a peaceful thing, knowing that they are not forgotten, that ABMC is taking care of them, and that the people of the United States are remembering their work, their duty, their professionalism, as well as their sacrifice. From the very beginning, these cemeteries were thoughtful. They are artistic. Every time a plant or a tree is replaced, it has to follow the exact plan. That's one of the beautiful things about these cemeteries. They don't sentimentalize. They are proud and strong. And you look at the architecture, it's, it was done with dignity and honor. And that's what's coming through.
There's a lot of things that goes into making this happen. I have a staff of 14, what I call artists, because every day they come here and they, and they put their magical touches on everything that they do. Um, there is not a day that goes by that my staff doesn't impress me with what they're doing. For example, if you take a bench, if you take a chair, a lot of people do not look into what goes into preparing that bench for our site. They tend to just look at it as something normal. And for us, I think it's not normal. Um, it's what we, that's what makes us unique. This is the centennial of ABMC. I'm not going to be here in a hundred years. But I like to think of whoever the superintendent is, whoever the green team is, that this will still be a living, vibrant place where descendants down the line of my family and all these other families can come experience a place where equality reigns, a place where each soldier is respected and honored for the service he provided. And ABMC is doing that now, and I am certain that it will be doing this in another hundred years. My name is Charlotte Jusna. I'm the museum curator here at ABMC. I'm in charge of all the collection of the agency. So this is an exact replica and a, a model of the Florence American Cemetery. This model, as you see, that was built maybe in the 50s, is exactly what the cemetery looks like right now. So it's really interesting to have the in front of you this small version of it and knowing that today, right now, it's still how it looks and it's exactly how it was built. I think it's a very important uh, testimony on the process and how we build cemeteries. It's very important to remember that everything has a meaning where we put the tree, where we put the building. Nothing is just there by accident. Everything was built in a way to commemorate the soldier. We're looking at the plaster molds. They're both in the Florence Chapel uh, facing each other. We can see the grid and some crosses that were made with a pen. This is the sign that this was used as a prototype. It's not a classical representation of an eagle. Normally the eagle is facing with the head looking on the side. It's interesting to have a sculpture that gives different way of interpretation. It's not only the America, but it's also the fight, the war, the, the sacrifice. It's a different way of uh, looking at it. My biggest dream is that maybe in 100 years we will have an ABMC museum somewhere with all of our pieces displayed. If you get someone or something that explains, well, they choose this color for this reason and they choose this type of trees or this type of stars for the other reason, it stick with you more. Like you get the information and you remember it a little bit more. I would love to see that exhibited somewhere with like a, a labels behind it that says ABMC collection. And I hope yeah, that that happens and it will be, I think, a really great, great thing to see. <laughs> We 
Well, the ABMC was established by act of Congress in March of 1923. There were at least two fundamental purposes. One was to create sites of remembrance, cemeteries, but ultimately monuments as well. On Hill 204, overlooking Shadow Pierre and the Marne River, stands this beautiful monument to commemorate the valor and sacrifices of the American soldiers who fought in the region. It is for me a distinct pleasure to see before me on this former battlefield so many veterans who served here and elsewhere with the American Army in the World War. General John J. Pershing was a living American hero. He was the equivalent of a six-star general. There had never been anybody holding rank that high in the American Army. I extend a warm welcome here today and trust that your visit to France may meet with your highest expectations. I greet you most cordially. He was very much a hands-on leader of the American Battle Monuments Commission. He wanted to be assured year in, year out that all that was, was being preserved. I'm leaving this morning for France to participate in the dedication of the first war memorial for those that gave their lives in World War II. We are surrounded here by those who paid the price of our mistakes or misconceptions. They paid the full price, and this must never be forgotten. For Marshall to come along a generation later, a World War later, with all of his skill and with all of his heart for the soldiers that had been under his authority as chief of staff of the army in, in the Second World War. That's just amazing to me. General Marshall was very anxious to see a cemetery in the Philippines to cement the post-war relationship between the United States and the Philippines because it was on the 4th of July, 1946, that the United States granted the Philippines their independence. When you see all of the white crosses, it just seems so anonymous. There's little distinction between the names, little distinction between the crosses. Filipinos and Americans 
are laid side by side in the same way that they fought, side by side, shoulder to shoulder. But that's the beauty of it. It's symbolic of the equality of the sacrifice of all of those that are buried and memorialized here. So we'll start in here. Our other cemeteries, most of which are in Europe, specifically cover particular battles or campaigns. But the Manila American Cemetery covers a whole range of battles and campaigns within the Pacific Theater of Operations. We have 17,000 that are buried out in the plots and about 36,000 names up here in the walls of the missing. And if you do the, the math, that would be more than 50,000 individual stories of those that served and died during the Second World War in the Pacific Theater. But today we'll My father joined me on a tour, and it's the first time that he's heard me take people around on a tour. It really opened his eyes to just how wide or expansive the, the story it is that we're, we're trying to tell here at, at Manila. I've always been very impressed with the way the U.S. honors and treats its veterans. My father being a veteran himself, I've seen firsthand how they treated him. And my son is now continuing the, the legacy, the heritage. I think that's important. As we walk among the walls of the missing, you'll find that there are state seals featured on the floors. But when I see this state seal in particular, I know that I'm in my favorite part of the walls of the missing. Because if you look up here, the second name from the top, you'll see the name Lim Vicente, Brigadier General, 41st Division, Philippine Army, entered service from the Philippines. And he happens to be my great-grandfather. My grandfather is one of the more recognized heroes of World War II. He was the first Filipino graduate from West Point. He survived the Bataan Death March. He was involved in organizing the guerrilla movement here in the Philippines until he got caught. Eventually executed. Even as a young boy, my great grandfather left quite the legacy. My grandfather, Vicente Jr., and my dad, Vicente III, really made it a point to make sure that I realized that legacy and how important it was to keep it going, to preserve it, to honor it. You know the famous war heroes, you know the battleships, you know certain aspects of history. We get an opportunity to speak about individuals that maybe didn't get the notoriety that some of the other heroes or battles have that they teach, you know, as we're growing up going through school. There was one letter before the fall of Bataan that he wrote his wife. probably the last known letter from those battlefields. He basically said, I sincerely give the credit to my officers and enlisted men. They're the ones who did it all. And mine was only to inspire and to lead them. And when history is written, I will give them all the credit and their satisfaction is mine to share. Sometimes, some of those stories feel like they kind of call out to you. I think those are the stories that are really important to tell because no one else is going to tell it. That's more than 50,000 individual stories that are just waiting to be told. If not me, then who? <laughs> if not now, then when? I'm a veteran myself and I serve, and I take a lot of pride in 
in my service that I did uh, for the United States Marine Corps. So I have that knowledge. I know their sacrifices and knowing what they've went through just for us to be able to be sitting here and do this interview and get this opportunity is something that I try to make sure that our visitors, our employees are aware of that, like the agency says, time will not dim the glory of their deeds. up because someone came and left them but they're getting old and someone next week's gonna come lay some more so we'll, we'll pick these up and make room for some new ones how about that good idea i'm a veteran i did 20 years went home i got a job that most people would have been happy to have uh, but i didn't have a mission there was nothing pushing me that sense of purpose that's where we're from the kids are getting a little older, so they're kind of starting to understand a little more what this is about. Like many of us who are here and are veterans, we've lost people in Afghanistan and Iraq or maybe even Panama and Desert Storm. We don't need this explained to us how important this is, the, the commemoration and the, the remembering. So I think it probably didn't take me very long at all to realize that, that uh, this is where I'm, I need to be. It's a good fit for me. I particularly like the cemetery because it's small and it's an intimate cemetery. I always say it's a family cemetery. They're all a family. The people who look after the cemetery are a family. And the people around the cemetery, the community, is a family. And it will always be looked after. Hey, Debbie, how you doing? Good morning. Good morning. I'm Johnny. Nice to meet you, Mr. Superintendent. How you doing? My uncle is Andrew Perry, who served in the 45th, 180th Infantry. He became a code talker. He was reconnaissance. And when they first landed, he would call back to another Choctaw on the other line, telling them where this is, this is, this is, and this is. They had to come up with their own codes. You know, what they would call a tank and what they would call a different equipment. Not one code was ever broken. None. Now, Andrew, I brought Mama to you this year. Have to take her back. It's nice to see someone else know about them because it was never talked about. His mother said goodbye, and that was it. I mean, that's really sad. I mean, I could never mm -mm, imagine hearing your son being killed and is buried. You're not gonna believe this when you see this. Mom, still, all this for Andrew? She said, look at this place. I have a daughter, her name is Liz, and she's been absorbing a lot. You'll be the one that has to tell the story. Yeah. yeah. I guess what everyone wants is to be taken care of and remembered. And he will never be forgotten. Never. Never be forgotten. I do have people who often come and say, I understand and I am grateful for what goes on here. Then they tell me, but younger generations don't. Thank you. And we can't blame it on all the younger generations. It's not exactly their fault. They just find themselves in a position where they're very far removed from the Second World War. We're all far removed from the First World War. Uh, but I think these places 
can be used, and we do actually use this cemetery as an educational tool for younger generations. We have school groups come all the time. So ABMC's mission is not just to commemorate, but we also educate. What is important and special about working for the ABMC is the ability to be a part of a collective effort to continue to tell these incredible stories. The ability for people to identify with something creates that emotional connection. It forms a stronger memory and it creates relevance. The American Battle Monuments Commission has always been interested in education. General Pershing himself understood the connection between soldiers dying, but for an objective, for a purpose. The ongoing work of education and preservation will always be unfinished. Closure is so important to families. There are families today who are still awaiting the location where their loved ones are interred. And there are also families where the family members have been buried with a Christian cross when they should have been buried with a Jewish Star of David. Tomorrow, we will be changing the headstones of two American soldiers who were identified as being Jewish versus of the Christian faith. So that is just an indicator of how ABMC is working with other federal agencies and other organizations to do the right thing. Someone once said that our flag, our American flag, does not fly because the wind moves it. Our flag flies with the last breath of each soldier who died protecting it. And it is precisely this that brings us here today. These Latin crosses that will be roofed today are not symbols that we say good riddance to. Rather, we bid them a fond farewell. We lower our heads in gratitude and respect to these silent civil sentinels who have so majestically stood guard over these young men for all of these decades. For all kinds of understandable and legitimate reasons, a number of American Jewish soldiers who were killed during the Second World War uh, were buried under Latin crosses. working together with the ABMC, whom we have found to be extraordinarily helpful, supportive, and respectful. We have embarked on an effort to right this historical wrong. Second Lieutenant Kenneth Earl Robinson, on behalf of the citizens of the United States of America, we thank you for your service. And Kenneth, on behalf of the Jewish people, we welcome you home. May the merciful one protect his soul forever. And may he bind his soul in the bonds of eternal life. The everlasting is his heritage. And may he rest in peace and let us say, Amen. There are many people here with me my dear family who wanted to join with their old mother and grandmother in her joy. And most of all, my dad, Ed Robinson, 
I feel him here with me, telling me, good job. Thank you so much. Closure. Closure to the families means a lot to our agency because it's important to us to know that we've done the right thing. And ABMC is a unique, small agency with a really special mission. And that's to keep the memories alive. What I would like for people to understand about the American Battle Monuments Commission, behind the scenes, uh, all our locally employed staff. The effort that they put in to ensure that they keep the cemeteries looking like it's one that the families and the veterans themselves would be proud of. And without those employees, it, it would not be possible. So we're very grateful for the employees all around the world that ABMC has as part of their agency. You know, General Pershing said, time will not dim the glory of their deeds. And it's a concept and really a charter to the whole effort of the American Battle Monuments Commission these last hundred years. We have to make sure that as we go farther away from the events, that their deeds are not diminished, that are not forgotten, that people understand what they did. And I think that as we look to the next hundred years, I think that same quote will drive what the American Battle Monuments Commission will do.
Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Mike Knapp. I'm the Director of Historical Services for the ABMC. And I'm happy to be kicking off tonight's discussion about the film we all just had the privilege to enjoy. Uh, as a quick note, we're happy to take questions from both our theater audience here and our live stream viewers. I'd like to quickly introduce our panelists. ABMC Chairman, Retired Lieutenant General Mark Hurtling. ABMC Secretary, whom you already heard from, Charles DeJou. Tom Connor, the author of War and Remembrance, the story of the American Battle Monuments Commission. And most importantly, Gretchen Ronka, daughter of First Lieutenant Lauren Hintz, who's buried at Florence American Cemetery. Before we begin our panel discussion, I'd like to take a moment to read from a letter sent to Secretary DeJou from the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, who was unfortunately unable to join us. In acknowledging the centennial anniversary, he wrote, it is not lost on me the amount of dedication required to ensure the memory of those who made the ultimate sacrifice defending our nation overseas will never fade. It is through the tireless efforts of the ABMC that the lives of these fallen heroes are never forgotten. He goes on to say, on behalf of the men and women of the US Armed Forces, I would like to thank the American Battle Monuments Commission for its continued support. We are grateful for the commitment to never forget. We certainly appreciate General Milley's words of recognition, all of which I think goes to the heart of the documentary. Though we may evolve, there's no end point to the ABMC mission. And our teams around the world will proudly continue to drive forward, honoring the service and sacrifice of the US military and sharing those stories for generations to come. Which seems like a good place to begin our discussion. I'd like to start with just initial reactions to the film from our panel. What were some of your first impressions from the documentary? And I will open it up to whoever wishes to go first. Well, I'll, I'll start. Uh, and then let me just say thank you again for all of you uh, joining us here in our, our centennial uh, celebration here of the ABMC. Um, for myself, I think what the film conveys and what touched me uh, is this legacy, it speaks to who we are as Americans, that the United States, I realize we as a people, we as a nation have not always been perfect. I, I, we all know America has made mistakes. But what comes through this film is the purity, the best of America. It's, it's our nation's values that we as a nation, that when we send young people forward, we don't send people to conquer or to enslave or to seize. We send young people, our best and our brightest and our finest of our nation, to go fight for words, words, freedom, liberty, democracy. And that we as a nation remember that and we we hold, and it's this special, incredible mission that the ABMC has to make sure this sacrifice is not forgotten. And it is the reflection of the very best and the very finest of what the United States has to offer and what the purity of American values are. And I think that's the legacy of our, of our agency, why I'm so humbled to be here in front of all of you. And I think it comes through in, in, in a lot of the film, especially in the connection with the stories of families and the families that, that made these sacrifices. And I hope, I hope all of you got that sense coming from this and, and joining us here tonight. You know, if, if, I, if I can join, because it, it, I'm smiling because Charles and I have been together too long. It's the same <laughs> kind of thought that I had just a minute ago. Uh, in fact, the phrase he used about uh, American military <clears throat> never wanting to conquer ground. Uh, the only ground we ask for is where we bury our dead uh, in foreign lands. And especially being here, the, the part about the values, I was thinking earlier this evening uh, during the reception, I went up and just looked at the Constitution. Um, and all of the men and women who are buried in our cemetery have a lot of things in common. They not only sacrificed for our nation, uh, for their families, for our way of life, but each one of them at some time, uh, usually during basic training or uh, when they were going through OCS or West Point, uh, they all had this, the common bond of raising their right hand and saying, I swear to defend the Constitution. 
And having spent a lot of time in Europe during my military days, I would ask other nations uh, that were, we were partner with what they vowed to defend, what oath did they take. And I'd get things like, oh, we defend our king or our president or our queen or the motherland or the fatherland. We are the only nation. The United States is the only nation that says we defend ideas, a piece of paper uh, that represent our values, who we are as a nation. So that's what makes it special. And what you see, what I saw in the film, going back to the question, Mike, is the translation of that to not only those who work as part of our agency, but those foreign nationals who are part of our agency too. I mean, the words that we heard from the French workers, the Tunisian workers that were all part of the film, uh, it seems that they've caught on to that but for a different reason, because in many of their places where our cemeteries are, their, their people were liberated by our military forces. So they have taken on that bond with us of defending ideas, living for values. Uh, this, this film was, in my view, phenomenal. It was very emotional to me. Well, Chairman Hurtling, I'd like to follow up with a question for you. Um, one of the things that we've talked more about in the past several years has been the importance of our sites both architecturally and artistically in relation to our mission. Can you address this concept of art as commemoration and, and how we saw in the film every aspect of these cemeteries is meticulously laid out with this in mind? Yeah, we, we have a couple of people that work as part of our interpretive team that we're very proud of. You saw some of them in the film. Um, you know, when you talk about the monuments, the statues, each cemetery is different. Each site is very different. There's no two that are the same. Uh, from the, the architecture to the, to the beautiful monuments, to the, the, the green lands, not just the grass, but the trees, as you saw as they were trimming the linden tree. Uh, what I was amazed at, having been to many of those cemeteries before becoming a member of the commission, I just thought it was a beautiful space. But since becoming a part of the commission, I've had some of our smarter people uh, tell me what all those things mean and what they represent. Uh, and that's one of the things I think uh, draws people to our sites, not only the reflection of the sacrifice and the honor and the courage that were exhibited by those who were laid to rest there, but also by just the, the design of the beautiful monuments, uh, the beautiful statuary, and the, the green space uh, each one of them is different, but each one of them is absolutely beautiful. One of the things I think is really important is the people, the green team. <coughs> you saw the picture of the man so gently laying the, the um, bench and polishing it. Every single person on that Florence American Cemetery green team is so sincere and so grateful, and they they touch the stones with tenderness and kindness. So the artistry of those human beings is coming out. That grass is artistically mowed. The sidewalks are artistically sh uh, swept. And it, it's, um, as you say, General, it's the gratitude over and over again. My family and I heard, thank you for your family sacrifice, but for all the Americans who came to save us from fascism. And I think that the, the importance of those local workers, those green teams and the cemetery staff who are, who are there every minute of the day taking care of us. And as the, uh, the last uh, speaker talked about um, knowing that her, her dad would be remembered forever. So those, it's, it's the staff and those cemeteries and the superintendents who supervise them so beautifully who are part of the whole artistic pattern. Seeing where we are tonight in this lovely auditorium and in this, this wonderful building where I have to put in a plug, I began my federal civilian career <laughs> many decades ago. I won't say how many. But Secretary DeJou, as, as, as you may have noticed, and some of you may have as well when you entered the Pennsylvania side of the building, under Robert Aitken's future statue, right in front of the National Archives building are the words, what is past is prologue. There's a great parallel there looking 
how the past 100 years has prepared ABMC for its next century. Can you speak to that and to the evolution of our mission into the future? Yeah, um, let me begin by saying here that, that I think it's especially poignant that we're here at the National Archives, you know, right above us. Uh, the Declaration of Independence, our, our Constitution, uh, Thomas Jefferson's actual writings of the, the life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But those documents right above us, the Declaration of Independence, the, the United States Constitution, the reason there is value in those documents is because of the service and sacrifice of all those service members that the ABMC takes care of around the world. The reason there is still meaning in those documents is for, because of what all those individuals did. And it is our sacred responsibility to make sure we remind the American people and remind the world about the value of those documents and those words and those ideas. It is what has translated over the last 100 years that, that gives proof positive that America is a nation more than just a place. America is, is a place that believes in the, the, the best values of humanity. You know, for our agency, I think for our first several decades, our agency, what our agency has always been about has not changed and will never change. It is about honoring the service and sacrifice of our service members. But how we are doing it is, is changing a bit. I think the first few decades, how we did it, the best way we could honor these, these values was taking care of uh, the widows, of the mothers, of the family members, um, and allowing the veterans who served at these, at these locations, these battlefields, to tell the stories. But now as so many of them are, are passing on, it becomes the responsibility of our agency to not only preserve the, the beauty of all of our cemeteries and our memorials, but to make sure that the stories of all of these service members continue to be told, that we are linking those documents upstairs to the sacrifices that they made and how we translate it into the future so that our nation, our people, and humanity do not ever forget that. And that's, that's what I look forward to our agency continuing to do. I have a question for the group, but I'm, I'm gonna throw it first to Professor Connor because I'm gonna put you on the spot here, but can you give us a historical perspective for why the ABMC was created, and, and how do you feel that that has changed the way that we as a nation and a people view the sacrifices of the U.S. military? Well, the ABMC was created to perform a mission that had never really been before the country uh, in the past. There'd never been a war in our history like the First World War that took millions of our soldiers abroad, literally, and uh, got more than 100,000 of them killed over there. So just the idea of what to do with the remains of all those soldiers, and of course the cemeteries are the, uh, the living embodiment of that part of the, uh, the ABMC mission. But uh, remembrance, of course, was uh, another major part of it. And uh, the fact was that until the ABMC was founded in 1923, uh, there was no agency of the government that was suited to perform those, mm -hmm. those missions. The ABMC had a predecessor called the Battle Monuments Board that resided entirely within the War Department. And their plan was to create a lot of small markers all over the European battlefields so that when Americans came over to visit, whether they were families of the dead or just tourists, they would be shown where the action was and, and where they ought to go. But uh, oddly enough, the Battle Monuments Board itself realized that it was five army officers, comprised of five army officers. They, weren't, they didn't have enough range of expertise and just competence in so many different fields. The, the film, the, the first adjective that I thought of besides magnificent was how comprehensive it was. It really did. It was a ground up, literally, presentation of how the ABMC performs uh, its mission to this day. And I really don't think there's a whole lot of change mm. uh, from 100 years ago. Now, there are 
more up-to-date efforts to get the message out. And I think one of the great sadnesses of all of us who know anything about the ABMC is that the general population of our country seems not to know uh, much about it at all. So um, I think there's plenty left to do. And uh, I think you're well equipped and you, you've got a wonderful <coughs> grasp of how to perform the uh, time-honored mission. I believe we have a question that came from the audience. Um, how much do headstones weigh, and why are they only two kinds? If you don't mind, I'll weigh in on that, yeah. no pun intended. Yeah. Um, our, sorry about that. That was totally unintentional. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Our headstones weigh approximately 130 pounds. And I, I say approximate because I'm not good at the, <laughs> at the conversion from kilograms to pounds. Yeah. But they're about 130 pounds. And if I may, with regard to why there are only two types of headstones, I'd like to throw that question to uh, my historian, Ben Brands, who has dealt with this a great deal. So sorry to put you on the spot, Ben. Uh, yes, yeah, so the, our headstones date to the temporary cemeteries that were established during World War I, and those were marked by simple white painted wooden crosses. Um, but the Jewish Welfare Board requested that the graves of Jewish soldiers be marked with Stars of David. And so the Graves Registration Service did that during the war. After the war was over, as they're planning the, the permanent cemeteries, there's a debate over what headstones to use. And, and the, uh, there was originally a plan before the cemeteries were turned over from the Army to ABMC to use kind of the headstone style that we see in the States in the National Cemeteries and Arlington National Cemetery. Uh, but Pershing and the other commissioners uh, were very adamant that we keep the feeling of these temporary cemeteries. They felt that in the years between the end of the war and the establishment of the permanent cemeteries, that this, this view of this white painted wooden crosses and white painted stars of David had become iconic of the sacrifice uh, of the American Expeditionary Forces. And so they adamantly pushed that the wooden crosses be replaced with marble uh, of Latin cross and star of David. Um, the, there has been talk at several times about uh, using other designs, but the feel has been that Star of David specifically represents Jewish soldiers. Uh, the Latin cross has transcended kind of Christian religious symbolism to generally represent uh, war dead and the remembrance of war dead. <coughs> and so a Star of David headstone indicates that the person buried there is specifically Jewish. Uh, the Latin cross is more universal, and so it does not necessarily designate uh, a devoted Christian faith, uh, people of other religions or of uh, atheist or agnostic uh, are also marked with Latin crosses. Thank you, Ben. Thank you for the question. Gretchen, I want to ask you a question. Your family invested so much time in, in searching for answers about your father's death in World War II, ultimately leading to the full excavation of his crash site in 2019. What does it mean to you and your family that his story will be con continue to be told and highlighted at Florence American Cemetery? Well, remains from my father's crash, uh, which happened on April 21st, 1945, are the original remains, a cup full of bones, were buried in the newly built Florence American Cemetery. So our family never didn't know where he was, but in, in 2016, um, it's a long story, but uh, some amateur archaeologists discovered the actual crash site of his P-47 plane, and volunteers helped excavate it, and his dog tags and human remains were found. And so we, the family, approached the Battle Monuments Commission to see about burying those newly found remains, which were identified through DNA testing, my brother and me. And ABMC rose to the occasion. And for two years, the staff at ABMC and the staff at the Florence American Cemetery worked with our family to give us 
a, bear, a memorial service and a full military burial. And it was an honor for us, but it was the first time since the cemetery had been built that there had ever been really a funeral for everyone. So we all felt that this was honoring not just my dad, but every single one of those 4,000 plus soldiers buried in that beautiful cemetery. And as I've said, my dad went off to war on a segregated troop carrier, troop ship. And we did a little exploration of the stories of the soldiers buried on all four sides of him. And two of them are African-American. And as Tom points out in his book, and as it comes out in the film, there is no segregation in those cemeteries. And so I'm, I'm getting off on my soapbox. But um, ABMC respected and honored and dealt with our wishes and we are so grateful to especially Angel Matos at the cemetery and to the, the staff of ABMC for, for approving that. Uh, the honor team from Ramstein base in, in uh, Germany brought dad's remains back. Um, it, the green team, just the, the total respect now. I will write a book someday, Tom, and you can, <laughs> I will tell you the whole story. Well, I think that'd be a wonderful book, and we'd, we'd certainly have it in our library. Uh, I believe we have another question. Uh, how was it determined who was buried in the cemetery? How was it determined who was buried in the cemetery? Yes. Um, I'll give the short answer, and Ben's looking at me like, don't make me tell the story again. Yeah. Um, but as you saw in the film, and, and, and Professor Connor, you can jump in if I get some of this wrong, which I surely will. Uh, the families were given the option to have the remains repatriated to the United States, or they could be buried in a cemetery overseas. And, and I think there's two options in the States. They could go to a family cemetery or a national cemetery. Or once the bodies were entrusted to the families, then the families yep. could seek to whatever kind of burial they wished. Yeah, and I, I think, uh, again, as was pointed out in the film, it's important to realize that of the 100% of those casualties from the war, only about, was it 30% or 40% are buried? 61 to 39 yeah, okay. uh, was the distribution exactly the same in both wars or after both wars. Yeah, which is really kind of unique. But I think what's also important to remember is when you understand that figure and that it's really the smaller amount that our cemeteries represent, when you look at Manila, when you look at Meuse Argonne, when you look at Normandy, to think that that's just 39% of, of all the casualties, it, it's phenomenal. And thank you for having the exact numbers. It's good to have the professor here. Another I have, question? I have another online question. How can we assure that the ABMC will always be funded? <laughs> Sir, I'm going to throw that to you. With hard work. <laughs> um, no, you know, um, I think this agency is a wonderful small agency that does so much. Um, this is an important part of the United States and, and the American people and the values that our, that our nation has. Um, you know, something I want to convey to all of you, to everybody who is, is, is watching online, I get it that on a day-to-day -day basis, I know so many of us, so many Americans, we feel frustrated what, with what might be going on in our nation. There's a, a lot of, of, of bitterness, divisiveness. I know uh, uh, many of us who have children just uh, frustrated frequently about what you see on the internet and social media and you know, what the heck is all this Twitter stuff about and whatnot here. And, and sometimes life on a day-to-day -day basis, sometimes in our nation just seems not quite right. But if you want to see something that's pure, something that is good, something that is honorable, something that reflects the best of the American people. It's what we do here at the ABMC. This is the finest of what America has in the reflection of our nation's very best values. This is an agency that for the past 100 years has been guardians of making sure we preserve these American values. And while I cannot say with confidence, uh, even as a, a former member of Congress, that we will always get funded. I say with reasonable level of confidence that because of what our agency does, these legacy, this value that we preserve, I am confident 
that will be here for another 100 years, continuing to protect the legacy, the values, the special place to preserve and protect the memories of the service and sacrifice of America's armed forces. And I'm eager to look forward to our next 100 years. And if, if I can add to that, um, as I think was said in the film, um, the, the first years after the war, uh, ABMC really was dedicated to helping those who were grieving the loss of their soldier, their Marine, their sailor, their airman. Uh, that grieving turned into, as the years went by, the colleagues and the buddies visiting there and sort of reliving uh, the past. As the film also said, the, uh, uh, the individual who went through and found each grave of, of his colleagues. Um, <coughs> The reason I'm convinced we'll always be able to get funding is because we have now turned into an education service, mm -hmm. uh, using our sites to talk about sacrifice, to talk about service, to talk about all the things that Charles just mentioned. Uh, I'm going to ask a question, if you don't mind, Mike, Go right the ahead, audience. Sir. Can I just see a show of hands of people who have never been to one of our sites, never been to one of our cemeteries or our <coughs> monuments? Okay, so there's a few. Uh, our hope over the next 100 years, starting this year in our anniversary, is to begin that education. To say, hey, if, if you're taking a trip outside the United States uh, to one of the five continents that our, our cemetery sites are, Take a little bit of time to visit. You, you won't be sorry. Uh, but like we have here in Washington, we have Arlington. Uh, and there are visitors that go there every day from all over the country as they come to the, to the city, uh, our fair provincial capital. In some of our sites overseas, and, and if you don't mind, I'll tell my, quickly tell my favorite story of the Netherlands American Cemetery in Margrat, my wife and I went there on Christmas Eve, not to the cemetery, but for another event. We happened to stop by the cemetery on Christmas Eve in 2012. And there were literally hundreds of Dutch citizens in that cemetery on Christmas Eve. And what we found out, and all the ABMC commissioners know this, is every single one of those graves, close to 8,000 graves in that cemetery, have been adopted by local Dutch citizens. And when we talked to some of the Dutch citizens that were there, a family with two twin boys told us that they had adopted two graves and had passed it from generation to generation, and they were passing it to their sons because they could teach them about liberation and freedom and the sacrifice of others that had died for their country. Uh, these are not Americans doing this. These are Dutch. Uh, I don't think we have that same kind of program here at Arlington, but I know that several of our cemeteries overseas certainly do with the local uh, citizens. And it's just a beauty to behold. People sometimes understand that more than we do as a nation. And as Charles says, we can get past the divisiveness that's kind of taking hold in our nation by just <laughs> spending a few hours at one of our sites. If, if I could just interject. If, if the ABMC ever doesn't get funded, <laughs> it will be because your millions are lost in the trillions of overall government spending. The agency has got to be the most efficient uh, agency and, and the most responsible with the money that it does spend. It does absolutely grand work uh, with what in the overall scheme of things, I say this respectfully, uh, pocket change to the federal government. And, the American people deserve to know that, I think. It's, a, it's meant to be a compliment to you. So. <laughs> we have another question? I have another online question. How can we find out more information about ABMC's mission? Um, I'll, I'll take that. There's plenty of opportunities. Um, um, of course, we would like all of you to visit our website, abmc.gov. Uh, but even better than that, um, please visit our sites. Um, all of our sites are special. You have seen just a very small sampling from this film, but it really doesn't give the true weight, the magnificence, the honor, and the awe until you actually go and visit them in person. And each one is unique. Each one is special. Uh, we are continuing 
uh, with the uh, 21st century and with technology here, we also uh, have a Twitter, a Facebook page, uh, social media posts. My PAO team will be glad to let you know with whatever there may be. But let me just start with, to, to learn more here, the easiest starting point is abmc.gov. Uh, but please, please, please visit our sites, visit our cemeteries, honor our service of our service members. And if you uh, want to plan your here. trip, go to our site because each one of the 26 mm -hmm. cemeteries in the 32 monument has their own two or three minute clip, depending, mm -hmm. talking about not yes. only how many are buried there, what the story is, but also some of the beautiful architecture and the things that make each one special has a two minute clip on each one of them. So it, you can, it, it will help you plan your trip to one of those places. And as a retired librarian, I have to put in a plug for Tom Connor's really <laughs> remarkable book. Yes. <laughs> Remember yes. this. It is an excellent, in-depth nonfiction. His source materials are excellent. It reads like a novel. It is absolutely fascinating. And in addition to all the contemporary digital information, a book is always a good place to start. <laughs> Actually, if I could add one thing real quick. I'm going to ask every single one of you here in the room to do me a favor. All of you have come here, and all of you have seen this film. One very small thing each and every one of you here this evening can do is go on whatever social media platform that you use, that you utilize, and put a hashtag. Say something about this evening. If you can put the handle at USABMC, we'd really appreciate it. But as much as we spread the word, it is all of you, and it is the public. The more you spread the word about the real, true, special meaning of the ABMC, the more it helps our agency, the more it helps our people, the more it helps our nation. And so please, every single person here, 30 seconds, before you leave those beautiful grounds of the National Archive, do something, do a post. Do that one small thing, and you'll help, you'll help spread the word of our agency here. So then that, thank you. Well, Tom, since Gretchen put you on the spot, I'm going to pile on. What would you say are some of the most significant historical changes at the ABMC? And, and what have probably been the most important consistencies? Well, the, consist the major consistency, I think, has been, which has been said so um, wonderfully um, and repeatedly tonight is the devotion to the mission. Um, the mission hasn't changed, will not change. And uh, over the generations, it has been so faithfully uh, performed. I think the, what's truly new is just the way that the agency tries to get its message out and uh, tries to draw people in by familiarizing themselves with the work of the agency, but also trying to appeal to the <clears throat> general population of our country to appreciate the sacrifice of the soldiers and, and to show, to learn how to show proper reverence, even in our daily lives, uh, for, for their sacrifice in every one of us committing, recommitting ourselves to live out the values that, uh, that those hundreds of thousands of soldiers gave their lives to, to defend. All the new ways, uh, I mean, this, this movie is a wonderful example of that. That nothing like that ever could have been done um, 60 or 80 years ago. One of the things that ABMC does every day, it posts a tiny bio on its um, Facebook page of one soldier who died on that particular day, and it shows the the burial site. And it's very interesting to see how many people respond to those posts. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just a thank you for your service, but sometimes there's more more in depth and it does, it gets back to telling the story and to making every single one of those crosses or stars of David representing a real human being who had a family, who had a life, who didn't have a future. So that's kind of like a little morning ritual to take. Yeah. And to me, that's one of the most exciting things, the research into the lives mm -hmm. of the uh, the individual soldier. I think at the two smallest cemeteries, Brookwood and Flanders Field, they mm -hmm. have something on every single one mm -hmm. of the soldiers mm -hmm. buried there. And that's just terrific. And that work will be ongoing mm -hmm. for years and, and years. Expanding. And expanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But to, to really bring to life um, those who gave their lives 
uh, in service to the country. Well, thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you all for joining us this evening uh, as we shared this uh, documentary with the world, hopefully, and commemorate our centennial anniversary. And I'd like to offer a special thanks to our panelists for their insight and reflection, and to our live stream audience out there uh, for taking time to be a part of our premiere. Uh, we invite you all to continue uh, to help us in our centennial celebration throughout the year. And thank you all. Have a wonderful rest of your evening. And as the secretary says, tell a friend about the ABMC. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Thank you.